Section fourteen of Oscar Wilde Art and Morality A Defence of the Picture of Dorian Gray Edited by Stuart Mason This Librivox recording is in the public domain Recording by Martin Geeson Section fourteen the note of doom that like a purple thread runs through the texture of dorian gray a revulsion from realism by anne h wharton footnote lippincott's monthly magazine september eighteen ninety in all ages and climes mankind has found delight in romances based upon the mystic the improbable and the impossible from the days when the norse poets sang their sagas through long northern nights and the fair scheherazade under southern moon charmed her bloodthirsty lord by her tales of wonder to our own day when stevenson and crawford and haggard hold fancy spellbound by their entirely improbable stories scott and buller played with master hands upon the love of the mysterious and supernatural inherent in mankind dickens and others have essayed to gratify its demands but with less daring and having an eye always on the moorings of the actual their success has been less marked with the elder hawthorne such romance writing seemed the natural growth of an exquisitely sensitive and spiritual nature while among later french writers theophile gautier and edmond abou have entered into the domain of the impossible as into the natural heritage of their genius sporting in its impalpable ether with the tuneful abandon of a fish in the sea or a bird in the air hampered by no bond of the actual weighted by no encumbrance of the material it is not strange that the great influx of realistic novels that has flowed in upon the last decade should be followed by a revulsion to the impossible in fiction men and women wearied with meeting the same characters and events in so-called romance that they encounter in everyday life or saddened by the depressing if dramatic pictures of tolstoy and the cool vivisection of humanity presented by ibsen turn with a sense of rest and refreshment to the guidance of those who like robert louis stevenson and ryder haggard lead them suddenly into the mystic land of wonder or like marion crawford and mrs oliphant delight to draw them by gentle and easy stages from the midst of a well-appointed setting of everyday life into the shadowy borderland that lies between the real and the unreal much of the success of such romance writing rests upon the rebound natural to humanity from intense realism to extreme ideality more perhaps upon the fact that this age which is grossly material is also deeply spiritual with these two facts well in view mr oscar wilde has fallen into line and entered the lists with some of the most successful masters of fiction in his novel the picture of dorian gray written for the july lippincotts mr wilde like balzac and the authors of faust and john inglesant presents to us the drama of a human soul while like gautier and abou he surrounds his utterly impossible story with a richness and depth of colouring and a grace and airiness of expression that make the perusal of its pages an artistic delight 
if mr wilde's romance resembles the productions of some of the writers of the french school in its reality and tone it still more strongly resembles mr stevenson's most powerfully wrought fairy tale dr jekyll and mr hyde although the moral of the story is brought out even more plainly as plainly indeed as in the drama of faust in both mr stevenson's and mr wilde's stories there is a transformation or substitution in one the soul of dr jekyll appears under different exteriors in the other some fine influence passes from the soul of dorian gray into his portrait and there works a gradual and subtle change upon the pictured lineaments although mr wilde's extravaganza is far less dramatic than that of mr stevenson it has the advantage of richer colouring and a more human setting if we may so express it the characters in the picture of dorian gray enjoy life more than mr stevenson's creations who seem to have had so dull a time of it at the best that they might have been expected to welcome a tragedy as a relief to the tedium of their daily lives mr utterson we are told was good but he was evidently not particularly happy which was the case with the other personages of the drama with the exception of those who were signally wretched on the other hand mr wilde's characters are happy during their little day their world is a luxurious perfumed land of delight until sin transforms it and even after lord henry has corrupted the nature of dorian gray with evil books and worldly philosophy he occasionally drinks of the waters of lethe and enjoys some fragments of what may be called happiness while lord henry himself seems to derive a certain satisfaction from the practice of his mephistophelian art and in his entire freedom from the restraints of conscience in a tale of the impossible it is not required that the writer should be true to life animate or inanimate yet in the fact that there are glimpses of light through the clouds that surround his dramatis personae that they inhabit a world in which the laburnum hangs out yellow clusters in june and the clematis robes itself with purple stars and the sun sheds gold and the moon silver despite the tragedy that touches the lives of its inhabitants is not mr wilde quite as true to nature as to art the reader may reasonably question the author's good taste in displaying at such length his knowledge of antique decoration and old-world crime as in chapter nine footnote chapter eleven in the eighteen ninety one edition which besides being somewhat tiresome clogs the dramatic movement of the story yet on the other hand it must be admitted that none but an artist and an apostle of the beautiful could have so sympathetically portrayed the glowing hues and perfumes of the garden in which dorian gray had first presented to his lips the cup of life and none other could have so pictured the luxurious surroundings of his home for whose embellishment the known world had been searched for hangings ornaments and bric-a-brac amid such an entourage of modern london life with its sybaritic indulgence its keenness of wit and its subtle intelligence mr wilde places his characters and works out his miracle 
viewing his own portrait just completed by an artist friend dorian gray turns from it filled with envy and dissatisfaction because it has been whispered in his ear that youth is the supreme possession in life and that when youth and beauty have fled from his face and form this pictured presentment will live for ever a perpetual mockery of himself whom withering age has overtaken under the influence of his evil genius lord henry wotton dorian gray utters a prayer that he may always remain young and the portrait alone reveal the ravages of time sin and sorrow the realization of this idea is the theory of mr wilde's romance and the air of probability with which he has endowed the absolutely impossible evidences the artistic and dramatic power of the writer the portrait of dorian gray painted in days of innocence and loveliness when his mere presence symbolized to the artist the entire harmony between beauty of body and beauty of soul changes day by day with the degradation of his nature while the living dorian gray after years of sin remorseless cruelty and corruption of thought and action preserves all the grace and fairness of his antinous like youth love in this romance is an incident not its crowning event although an important incident as a revelation of the character of dorian gray the reader never meets sibyl vane he merely sees her on the stage and hears of her from the lips of her lover yet even thus she appeals to us as an exquisite personation of maidenhood with all its purity and all its tenderness as shadowy an outline as the fair child whom buller allows to captivate the imagination of kenelm chillingly who caught butterflies talked philosophy and died young yet who in her brief transit across his path realized to his poetic soul all the best possibilities of life spiritual and material sibyl vane comes to us girt about with ideal charm to fulfil her widely different mission which was to reveal to dorian gray the sad fact that his soul had passed beyond her sweet and ennobling influence his artistic and intellectual senses were touched by her beauty and dramatic power but to the beauty that made her worthy to be loved his eyes were blind his heart was insensible the tragedy of the story the climax of the situation is not the death of sibyl vane nor even the pitiless murder of the friend who dared to give dorian gray good counsel but the disclosure that dorian's soul once open to all good influences had by yielding to the malign domination of his evil genius passed beyond the reach of love pity or remorse it is needless to say that dorian gray is not a very substantial character the most entertaining though not the most exemplary personage of the story is lord henry wotton who by his preaching and practice of the doctrine of hedonism leads dorian gray into all known and unknown evil until finally his darkling shadow outreaches in depravity the imagination of his tempter when his victim has sunk so low in sin that the world shuns him lord henry still enjoys his gay conscienceless existence and continues to utter the persiflage that constitutes much of the attraction of the book as well as of his society 
debonair witty learned giving expression to aphorisms as keen as the sayings of thackeray's characters with the moral element eliminated and as cynical as those of norris with exquisite taste and the fascination of a finished man of the world lord henry belongs as truly on the material side of his nature to the life of to-day as he appertains on its spiritual side to the region of pluto a gay child of the great london social world he hovers airily around and about the emotions of life declaring that death is the only thing that ever terrifies him and that death and vulgarity are the only facts in the nineteenth century that one cannot explain away the climax of lord henry's sardonic worldliness is reached when he becomes the spectator of his own domesticity if he may be said to have any and speaks to dorian of his divorce from his wife as one of the latest sensations of london remarking apropos of his music the man with whom my wife ran away played chopin exquisitely poor victoria i was very fond of her the house is rather lonely without her lord henry is so entirely true to himself and the worst that is in him that towards the close of the book when dorian announces that he is going to be good and begs his friend not to poison another young life with the book with which he had corrupted his we find ourselves trembling for dorian's one remaining ally especially when he exclaims my dear boy you are really beginning to moralize you will soon be going about warning people against all the sins of which you have grown tired you are much too delightful to do that besides it is no use you and i are what we are and we will be what we will be had not the hero stabbed himself or his picture which was it it is only a question of time how soon dorian gray with the slightest obtrusion of conscience would have ceased to charm him who had welcomed him as a debutant on the stage of pleasure where to use his favourite saying the only way to get rid of a temptation is to yield to it dorian gray struggling against the temptations of the world would have proved an inartistic and disturbing element in the life of lord henry all that is needed to complete the tale is lord henry's own comment on the highly dramatic taking off of his friend this chapter mr wilde true to his artistic instinct has not finished preferring to leave appetite unappeased rather than to create satiety by making his mephistopheles say precisely what one would expect him to say under the circumstances end of section fourteen